kind of fun. I just the more I read the Psalms, the more I get excited about them. So I'm sorry that I, I kind of let off my steam when I come in here to tell you how excited I am about the Psalms. And uh, this particular one, it just it unfolded before me in a way that I told my wife was just absolutely amazing uh, to me. Uh, sometimes it's like pulling teeth, you know. You just pull and you pull and pull and finally you get one piece out and then you get another piece out. And this one just kind of unfolded all of a sudden, you know, right before my eyes. Uh, and I, I mean that almost literally. I was writing my notes and it was just kind of, oh, wow, wondering what amazing. Uh, so may the Lord bless us as we uh, study his word together uh, this morning. Psalm 105 is one of three psalms. Um, that unfold the history of Israel, particularly around the Exodus uh, period. And uh, there are others that mention various parts of uh, the uh, Exodus experience. But these three Psalms, uh, 78, 105, and 106, unfold in some length the importance of uh, the Exodus event for the people of Israel. They have slightly different tone in them. Uh, one example, 105, is almost completely positive. There's no mention of the people's sin at all. 78 and 106 both tend to be more negative, but 78 is more specific as to why it's being uh, presented. And so I've listed those verses there for uh, Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8. Specifically, the psalmist says, the reason I'm telling you all of this is so you can tell your kids and they can tell their kids. And so you won't be like that generation that disobeyed God and had to wander around for 40 years so that you won't have their rebellious spirit. Learn from them. It's an amazing thing. There are virtually no other people on the face of the earth that I know of, and certainly not historically, uh, who will look at their faults and failures before their God and talk about them for the purpose is to not repeat them the old saw about if you don't know history you'll repeat it (laughs) people are ignorant of history repeat it Uh, but the Israelites were saying we don't want to do it we don't want to repeat it so it means that you have to know even the sinful parts of history in order to avoid that as a warning to pass it along. Right? Now, I've thought about this a little bit in terms of my family. Do I really want to tell my children some of the things that I did as a young person? No, I don't think so. Right? Uh, but here they are, telling what it is that God did and how we didn't respond, how we failed to respond. But 105 is almost completely positive. I debated whether to try to do 105 and 106 at the same time to kind of overlap them. But I thought, no, that's simply far too much material to uh, try to do that. So we'll look at the positive one uh, today. Maybe we'll try 106 next week. I don't know yet. Uh, We've got uh, got a lot of Psalms left in front of us and a lot of good ones left in front of it. Uh, And so we'll, we'll see what unfolds. But anyway, back to where we are here, Psalm 105. And I've mentioned then at the introduction of the outline that uh, these uh, psalms are uh, focused on the ways in which they can encourage faith and obedience. So there is both encouragement and there are warnings about being disobedient and pass those on to the next generation. And 105 is, as I said, the most positive of the uh, psalms. But in any case, What we have here, the focus of 105, is on God's marvelous doings, his interventions in order to deliver his people so that he might fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to the patriarchs. And the way in which those promises are fulfilled and the unfolding of them. And so I took the uh, title for the lesson, Sing, Remember, and Obey, from the first few verses and the last verse, right? Uh, So these are kind of the bookends of this psalm. Sing, remember, and obey. And we'll look at them as we uh, move along. The psalm opens in the first seven verses 
by what I have termed here a call to worship. It is a community psalm. There is the individual writing the psalm, but it's a community psalm. It's all about us as a community and what God has done for us. Each individual then is called to accountability with knowledge he or she is to respond to what God has. And one of the things that it shows us, as does 78 and 106, is that even at this point in history, the Jews had apparently an intact Torah, an intact, what we would call the Pentateuch, the first five books, the books of Moses. And they read them, they were a part of their worship time, a part of their time in the tabernacle, and then later in the temple, and much, much later, of course, in the synagogues. The synagogues appear to have started during the Babylonian captivity. And that would have been later probably than these, this psalm is. But in any case, uh, the reading of the Torah and the knowledge that they needed of it. And so the importance of this. This call to worship in these first seven verses. And the things that, that we have there in the verse that they occur, they occur in. So he begins by give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name and then sing to him, sing praises to him in the first two verses. But watch what happens. As soon as he says, give thanks to the Lord, make his deeds known to the peoples. Usually the word peoples means the Gentiles as well as their fellow Jews. Sing to the Lord, make known, right? What happens here by telling of his wonders in verse two. And so this call to communal worship, remember that when Abraham went in to the land of Canaan, he built an altar and he worshiped God and it was public. He didn't enclose it and go inside the enclosure. It was out in the open for people to see what he was doing and see the, the importance here of their worship being open so that people can see. Does that mean that we ought to worship all the time in the open and not inside our buildings? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean we need sometimes to worship out in the open, right? In the city park or wherever uh, kind of thing. He goes on then in verse uh, 3 to uh, glory or exalt, the, uh, the uh, NLT says. Glory in his name, exalt in his holy name. I think of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The importance. I, in fact, I've been taking notes to talk about the Lord's Prayer in the book of Psalms and elsewhere in Scripture. It's amazing how many times that prayer is referenced in a sense. It had not yet been printed, of course. Had done not, not yet been uh, given in literal terms, or Jesus talks about it. But the Holy Spirit's already working toward that prayer. And here we have it. Glory, exalt in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And then in verse 4, seek the Lord. Another part of the worship coming in and seeking the Lord. Asking for his presence. Seeking for his presence. Seek his presence, not only his strength, but his presence continually. And then remember the wondrous works that he has done. His miracles and the judgments he uttered. And he calls them specifically on the covenant relationship. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There in, in verse 6. But remember his deeds. Right? And his judgments. So it includes two things. There are the deeds, the miracles that he's done. And the things that he says about them. The judgments involves also God's words about his actions. His actions are not discernible to us. In ways that without his words... That we would fully understand them. We would in fact be perplexed by them. Just as we are about many things today. We're fairly certain that God is active. But we're perplexed. How do we identify his actions. In the midst of all the other actions that are going on. Because we don't have a specific revelation from God. That this is what he is doing. Right? We know pretty well. I mean when we have a sense in, of the fellowship of God. And in, in, in his presence in our congregations or in our worship times or in our prayer times. We know that's God's presence. And we can say that it's God's presence. But we don't have a full revelation of that in the larger world. 
in which we which we live. Why? Because we need his judgments. We need his word. And that's why we do need to be reading the scriptures all the time. It does help us to discern, right? And help us helps us to understand. And uh, anyway, we'll we'll leave that and go on with the last thing he says then, which I've called a confession, for lack of a better word for it. Remember at verse seven, confession. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth, right? Confession here is not confessing sin, but confessing who God is in relationship to us. Not only who he is in relationship to himself, the things he's revealed to us, but the fact that he is our God. We confess, God, you are our God. And that means submission to you. That means listening to your judgments, being aware of what you want us to know and to understand. And so this call to worship is the communal call. All of us get together and listen to this. And that's when we really have the joy of the Lord. I mean, we have the joy of the Lord at times individually, right? But the presence of the Lord and the joy of the Lord and asking him to be present and work uh, in our congregations, wherever we uh, assemble and worship with the people of God. So this is where it starts, the call to worship, these first uh, seven uh, verses and the various things that are here with an emphasis on making it public right? in a way that, that people know. Remember that the Lord says uh, through the Apostle Paul with regard to taking communion, as oft as you do this, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. There's something about taking communion that has a powerful testimony. Right? Even though we're inside the building and people don't know when we're doing it, but there's something about it that bears witness to the angels present as well as to others that this is the Lord. But that's another matter. We'll take that up later on. Right? So by the way, we'll finish up Psalms by the end of the year. And we're thinking toward next year already. <laughs> and if there's something you want to do, we've had one request already. I won't tell you what it was for. One book uh, to uh, study. But if any of you have a suggestion of a book or a topic that you'd like to pursue, okay? or if you want to tell me to retire, please go home and don't come back. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Otherwise, we'll start thinking about it and seeing what the Lord has in store for us. Uh, so the next block of verses, uh, verses uh, 8 uh, through uh, 15, I divided them into two sections here. The Lord is both a covenant maker, and we see this in the first few verses, down through verse 11, and then at 12 through 15, we see that he is the one who sustains the covenant. Now, the covenant is the basis on which God acts to bring about the exodus. Remember that when he comes to, uh, to when he comes to Moses, he tells Moses what he's doing, and he remembered his covenant with the people of Israel. What is that? The end of, of uh, chapter one, first part of chapter two of the book of Exodus. Uh, he remembered that covenant that he had made with him. Remember the promise in that covenant when God made it and reaffirmed it in chapter fifteen. He tells them, your people are going to be in a land of captivity for 400 years. And then I'm going to come and take them out. So his remembering here was not as though he had forgotten. It means rather that he now is ready to act. It's his time to do what he had covenantly promised to do. And so we have this promise as the covenant maker. The importance of this covenant to us is an important one because it manifests something about the nature and the character of God. This passage in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, is an incredible one. I want to turn there, uh, and we'll come to it in just a moment. So here are the verses in uh, 105 that we are looking at. He picks up, and we're picking up at verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. Okay? That word, forever. How long does God remember his covenant? Until next week? Right? Some of us go through the refrigerator and we can't remember what we're there for. <laughs> <laughs> he remembers his covenant forever, the scripture says. And uh, the word he has commanded for a thousand generations. If a generation is 40 years, 
How many years is that? 40,000 years. Right? Amazing. The, the, the psalmist here, of course, is doing everything he can to demonstrate that God cannot possibly forget his covenant. And the covenant he made with Abraham, he swore in a promise to Isaac, and he confirmed it to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. So the three patriarchs and then the nation all get listed here, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. That's the specific part of the promise now he's going to unfold. Why does God bring them out of Egypt? In order to bring them into the land of promise. You've heard preachers talk about that. He brings them out in order to bring them in. Uh, kind of thing. Well, let's go to the book of Hebrews now. I want to pick up this. He's the covenant maker. And the promise that he makes. I picked up there in, in your notes at verse 17. I want to back up to the opening of the paragraph. Which actually starts at verse 13. So Hebrews Chapter 6, verse 13. And the writer is talking to those Hebrew Christians about the fact that God's covenant promises to them in Christ Jesus are promises that he cannot and will not forget. What evidence do we have that God will not forget his promises? And the answer is, look at what he did for Israel. Right? The scripture never asks us, People talk about sometimes blind faith. Just take a leap in blind faith. That's not what scripture does. God wants evidence. And he gives it to us. That's where we can stand. And so it is that he says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater by whom he could swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And we'll talk more about the multiplication later. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all of their disputes, an oath is final for a confirmation. A promise and an oath. Let's watch what he does with this. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, that is the promise and the oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so what he does here with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel in this short passage of making a covenant between verses 8 and 11 in Psalm 105, right, is what he does for us in Christ Jesus. And the writer of the book of Hebrews doesn't leave any guesses about that. This is not, I think this is what this means. The writer of the book of Hebrews, this is what this means. <laughs> that God's promise to us is, is uh, unbreakable and unshakable. Right? It doesn't mean our faith won't quiver sometimes. It just means that God isn't going to quiver. Right? But God not only is the maker of the covenant. Right? Have you ever made a promise that you couldn't keep? Right? You made a promise, you thought you could do it, and then it turned out that you couldn't. For one reason, or other, things intervened, or you didn't have the money to do it, or whatever. You know, it turns out that you couldn't do it. God never is in that position. He can always sustain what he has promised. He can always do it. He can always accomplish it. So what do we have? Picking up then at verse 12 of Psalm 105 and going down through 15. When they were few in number, that is his people, the, the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, even before that, while we're still dealing with the three patriarchs themselves. A uh, few in number and of little account and sojourner in it, that is the land of promise, wandering from nation to nation, people group to people group, from kingdom to another people. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, touch not mine anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. 
I listed there in those uh, scriptures that follow from the book of Genesis in chapter 20, 26, 31, and 35, four different places where God says to all three of the patriarchs, right, that he will protect and keep them. So let's go back to the very first entry. We won't take time to read all of this. Back to the very first entry, which is in chapter 20 of the uh, book of Genesis and dropping down to uh, verse 7. The account here is about Abraham and Abimelech and what happens. And remember that when they had gone down to Egypt, Abraham told the people that Sarah was his sister. Right? So Pharaoh takes her into his harem. He does it again with Abimelech. Now by this time, most of you wives would have strung this guy up by his thumbs on piano wire. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Take care of this guy. He does it again. And God protects Sarah again. Right? From him. And then he says to Abraham, right? And, uh, uh, excuse me, to uh, Abimelech. Uh, Abimelech says to God, uh, in a, uh, you know, saying to him, I was innocent. And God says, yes, I know you were. And that's in, in uh, verse 6. And that's why I kept you and protected you. And now in verse 7. This is where it connects directly to what he says there in, in the, the psalm. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you don't, then you're going to die. He's a prophet, and he'll pray for you and you will live. And we see the importance of his sustaining this promise. He does it also then with the other two fathers, or patriarchs to Isaac and to Jacob. And I'll let you look at those scriptures and see how uh, God uh, protects them and promises. Now, I want just to, to take a quick aside here. Many of you have heard uh, some uh, preachers, whether on television or elsewhere, claim, I'm a prophet and don't you dare touch me. Yeah. <laughs> so my response to that is, I won't touch you, but I'm going to touch the off button on the TV. <laughs> right? No way. That's not at all what that scripture is talking about. And it can't be used in that form, in that way. Does that mean that we're open? We can criticize our preachers and other people? No, the scripture does talk about it. Having reverence and respect and trust. If criticism needs to be done, it's to be done in private, Right? Uh, and all kinds of things. There are ways to deal with these sorts of things without doing, you know, the other kinds of things. But in any case, uh, I just had to put that in there. Because <laughs> I've heard people do it, but it's just you know, strong. Anyway, back to where we are here. So, the Lord is the covenant maker, and he is the sustainer of the covenant. So there's the call to worship, right? Come and worship. Who are we worshiping? This one who's made the covenant with us. And historically, he's been sustaining the covenant and sustaining the people. So what can we trust then? One, that we belong to the covenant right? and that he will protect and keep us. That's what the call is to the people of God here. The positive thing is to encourage them to go on trusting the covenant, whatever the circumstances may be, right? And here we, again, as I said, we get the positive uh, things emphasized here. So then what does he begin to unfold? The long middle part of this psalm runs from verse 26 through verse 36. And where is it that God can keep his people and finally deliver them? He can keep them through 400 years of being out of the promised land. And some of that, we're not sure exactly when the enslavement took place, but probably at least a hundred years before they were freed. And their freedoms were probably reduced even before that. But in any case, he's been sustaining them through all this period of time. We do know from other places in scripture that many of the Israelites had turned aside, started worshiping the Egyptian gods, and had forgotten the things that God had said to the fathers. Uh, but there was nonetheless God's remembered and listening to them and taking care of them. So what happens here? 
we begin to see, and I divided this block of material, these 20 verses, 21 verses, into uh, three different blocks. First of all, what he says about Joseph, then about the fruitfulness of Israel, that we've already seen one reference to, then we will see some other references to. And then to the plagues themselves. And by the way, with regard to the plagues, we'll see when we get there, only eight of the ten are mentioned. Uh, and we'll see which ones they are and uh, potentially why. So what would you have, do we have here? First of all, he mentions uh, Joseph. Joseph, he says, is a man sent when he summoned a famine on the land and broke the supply of bread. So this puts us, Joseph is already in Egypt. He's had, Pharaoh's had his dream of the seven lean years and the seven, seven fat years and then the seven lean years. And the famine was going to come so there are the fat years, and then there are the lean years, and the famine comes, and it is so extensive that even the land of Canaan, where Jacob and the rest of the kids, the rest of the boys, and their families are all living. Right? So he broke the supply, or the staff of bread. But already he had sent before them, sent ahead of them, something like 13 years prior to this. Not sure of the exact timing, but 13, 14 years earlier, he sent a man ahead of them. Joseph, who was sold by a slave. What a strange way to send somebody somewhere else. <laughs> Sell them into slavery and ship them out. Right? And yet this is God's amazing plan uh, to get Joseph down there. And not only to get him in the land, but to put him where he needed him to be in order to accomplish his purpose. So the thing continues to unfold. He was sold as a slave. His feet hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. One scholar remarks that they didn't know much about iron. It was probably bronze, which makes it even worse. <laughs> but in any case, until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. I want to come back to that verse. That's the one I want to focus on. And then the king sent and released him, and the ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind or to instruct, some uh, translation sap, instruct his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. And the amazing thing that happens here. So what words is it that tested Joseph? What did he say that was a testing for him. There are three kinds of things that he said all become possibilities for the reference that the psalmist makes here. Excuse me, one moment. All become possibilities. And maybe all three blocks of material here from the book of Genesis are uh, the ones that he said. But let's go back and look at them. And we can identify what the words of jo uh, Joseph were that were waiting to be fulfilled, right? First of all, in chapter 37, we have the statement about the two dreams that Joseph has. And he tells his brothers about them. The first dream, he says that we were out harvesting in the fields, and my sheep stood up straight, and yours bowed down. Right? Upset his brothers. But then he has another dream. And not only do the brothers bow down, his mother and his father bow down before him. And his father, like Mary, later on with things regard to Jesus, his father kept the saying in mind. So these have to come true. If this is really the word of the Lord, if these dreams are the word of the Lord, when are they going to come true? The brothers sold him into slavery simply because they said, ain't going to happen. We're going to take care of that and make sure you're out of the picture altogether. But he was sent in order for these prophetic words to be fulfilled. Go a little bit further. Over to the 40th chapter. Jacob is now, or excuse me, Joseph is uh, now in uh, prison. And his fellow prisoners, the baker and the... Uh, who's the wine tester or whatever he is, forgotten what he is, 
Anyway, yeah, the man who brings the wine to him. Uh, Cupbearer, thank you. Uh, have these dreams, and he tells them what's going to happen. The baker is going to get executed, and the cupbearer will be restored to his position. So when, you, when you're there, don't forget who I am and where you met me. Right? So this word, too, needs yet to be fulfilled. Been two years, and the cupbearer hasn't had a thought about Joseph. So those words, too, need to be fulfilled. Then go on over to uh, chapter 45. Chapter 45, we're dropping down to, uh, where am I here? Verse 5. Uh, verse 5. Uh, so Joseph had said to his brothers, his brothers are there now. And here's what he says to them. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent a man, Joseph, down there. So how are these words to be fulfilled? All of them are fulfilled in the same set of activities that go on with Joseph being called for out of the prison and being put in a position where all of those, he was second in command under Pharaoh. So all of the other leaders of Egypt were instructed by him. You need a wise man to be able to manage this, who's wiser than you. So Joseph becomes the instructor for the other wise people and the other officers and all the other people that would be involved in saving up, storing up the grain, and managing and accounting for it, and paying, you know, uh, receiving payment from other peoples and all the kinds of things that would happen here. And so he instructed the kinds of things. If this is true, right, cannot God raise up right, those who can manage the teaching of his word to us right down to the present time? I hesitate to include myself in that, by the way, though I'm, I'm aware that I have to be accountable and be careful and pray and trust the Lord to, to guide me. But I'm thinking especially about our pastors, the men and women who stand before us on a weekly basis, and they minister the things of God to us in the presence of the people of God, all the people of God in our congregations. These men and women whom we pray for, most of us, I expect, pray for our pastors every day, lifting them up before God. Which is, you know, just, well, it's just amazing, you know, how God gives the church, Paul says, he gives the church pastors okay, and apostles and prophets and so forth. He works uh, with us. And so we have this. He sends Joseph down. But he also says in the second block of material here, so I'm at Roman numeral three now on the outline at capital letter B, right? And we're at verse 23 in the, uh, in the uh, Psalm, Psalm 105, verse 23. Then Israel came to, to, down to Egypt. Jacob is alive, or Joseph is alive and well. Come on down and he'll take care of you down there. So he comes down and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Remember, Ham was the, the son of Noah, whose descendants settled in North Africa. And so the Egyptians were a part of the uh, Hamites. And the Lord made his people fruitful. That's what he told Abraham. I'm going to make them into a powerful nation right there in the midst of their oppressors. I'm going to make them a powerful nation. And so the Lord made his people very fruitful. And he made them stronger than their foes. And he turned their foes' hearts, their hearts, to hate his people and to deal craftily with his servants. And you can see in these various places in the book of Exodus, where I've mentioned before, in chapter 1, in uh, three places, in chapter 2, and then in chapter 6, he talks about the fruitfulness of the people and how they grew and how uh, the, uh, the uh, pharaohs tried different things to suppress them so they wouldn't grow, working the men extremely hard, but they continued to grow. So then throw the babies into the Nile River, right? First of all, telling the, the uh, uh, 
midwives, kill the boy babies. They wouldn't do it. So he told all of the Egyptians, throw them into the river, get rid of them. And we don't know how many they killed, but what we do know is that the people continued to grow. It was God's time. It was God's boon. And so the people began to grow. And so they were fruitful, even though what was happening was horrific to them. But what was God getting ready to do in chapter 6 of Exodus? He says, now, now I'm ready. I need my people to come out. And I'm going to bring them out full strength, ready to go, ready to walk into the promised land. It took them 40 years, but that was their choice rather than God's choice. And so we have it. So then we have, starting in verse 26, a long section going down through verse 36. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. And they began performing the signs, the very signs and wonders that happened there. Moses and Aaron, right? Aaron, you remember, is older. He's three years older than Moses. This we discovered, but Exodus 7-7, seven, seven, I think it is, that tells us that uh, Aaron was 83 and Moses was 80. This is just as they're getting ready to lead the people out of the uh, promised land. And so there they do the plagues, the various plagues that God had put in their, put it in their power to do. And this picks us up then at the first uh, verse of chapter 7 in the book of Exodus and run down through, through chapter uh, 12, verse 32. The latter part of uh, chapter 12 is more instructions about the Passover, which had first been broached in the early part of chapter 12. And so we get the 10 plagues that are unfolded here. He starts with the plague of darkness. Why? Apparently because what is happening here is a darkening of the minds of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Their sinfulness had been dark and bloody and brutal, right? And now God begins to darken them. Pharaoh refuses to listen. And so finally the scripture says, and God hardened his heart. He puts him in the dark. He has no idea what is happening in terms of what it means. So there's no repentance on his part. And so to start with the plague of darkness, and then he goes on and mentions the others, and, of course, the very last one at verse uh, 36. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the fruits of all their strength and the death of the firstborn. God's judgments were in the land. He says that he judged the gods of Egypt and the Egyptians. Right? Was there justice for those little babies that got thrown in the Nile River? Yes, there were. It was a justice appropriate. It was not, God told Pharaoh, you know, I could have wiped you out and all of your people. By this time, I could have simply wiped you off the face of the map. And not a one of you would have survived. But here his judgment is appropriate to the crime. It's a, it's a text in the ancient world that stands all out there by itself. Virtually no other peoples had a notion that a crime should be punished only according to the crime itself. Right? Not because that person was too weak to defend themselves or because they were poor and so they deserve greater judgment or because I'm mad and I can do it. You know, that kind of thing. No, the punishment must fit the crime. It works in our country right down to the present day. Does it? Well, it's supposed to. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Right? I just saw a headline on the news about a guy in Chicago who was accused of murder that he did not commit. He was jailed for it. He just won an award from the city of Chicago of $50 million. Right? He probably won't get that much, but the you know, point here is that we believe that crime should be punished, but only according to right judgment and to an appropriate level. Where does it come from? Right here in the Word of God, right? in the Bible. The only people in that ancient world who had this concept, and the only ones who held on to it and passed it on into the Western world and right on down to the present day. So we don't cut people's hands off when their fingers pick up something that doesn't belong to them. Right? Other people still do that in the world. And so we have this importance of this 
Israel would be fruitful and the plagues would come and God would deliver them. So now comes the fulfilling right? where he's been headed all this time. Verse 37 down through 44. Then he brought out Israel with the silver and the gold. Remember he told them, ask your neighbors for silver and gold and they come out. It was so much that uh, the book of Exodus says they plundered the Egyptians. They went out with the, their silver and their gold. And there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the dread of them had fallen upon, the dread of the Israelites had fallen upon uh, the nation. He spread a cloud for them and covering notice all the things he begins to talk about now. And the details. He gave them food, quail, and bread from heaven. He opened the rock and gave them water. He remembered, verse 42, he remembered his holy promise to Abraham, his servant. Back to the covenant. I started in Genesis 12, God could say to them, and I haven't stopped. I'm still being faithful to my promise. And in 2024, in September, whatever today is, the 10th, you know, he can still say, I am my covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and my son Jesus is still your covenant. And I haven't forgotten it. I know who you are. And I'm taking care of you right down to the present day. So how do we know this? Uh, Roman numeral five. Right? God has a purpose in doing this. Verse 45 of, of Psalm 105. That they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. What's the purpose, God, of bringing your people into the promised land? that they might do your will. What's your purpose, God, in bringing us out from the power of sin that you might do my will? Notice how many times when the Apostle Paul prays for the people of God in his various, various letters, he prays for them to be worthy of the calling, to know that calling, to be empowered to keep it, and to be worthy of it by the power of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in them. It takes us all the way back, doesn't it? And the promise, and we see it working through. Remember I told you the themes in the early part of the Bible run into Psalms, and the themes in Psalms just keep right on going. Right on through our lives. Right on down to whenever Jesus comes. You know, in the next few minutes, or you know, in the next generation, I, who knows? Uh, we don't, but we are trying to be faithful. And so... We see this in Psalm 125, 3. Why, he says, do I not want you to live under governments that are wicked and evil? This is Psalm 125, verse 3. Because, he says, if you put my people under a wicked government, they might do wickedness. And so we want a legitimate government over them that is faithful to the things of God. And so we see in Luke, this is when uh, God is prophesying through, what, what was uh, John the Baptist's father? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Anyway, Zechariah, yes. When Zechariah is prophesying toward the end of Luke chapter 1, right? he says about them that God brought them out for the purpose of that they might freely live his will. I don't want you to be under the judgment of a nation or a people whose laws are wicked in case you agree that, oh yeah, that's good. We'll, we'll follow that. Just think of the wicked laws that are being passed in our nation. Yes. Right? And the people of God have to live under those laws. But God has a plan. <laughs> God has a plan. And that's where the conclusion comes here. This is the longest conclusion I've ever written. <laughs> And we don't have time to read all of these scriptures. I'll have to leave you to read them. But it establishes, first of all, and so let me just start down through, through this uh, conclusion. God delivered his people from what was the most powerful empower, empire in the Near and Middle East. Possibly, even at that time, not India, not China, probably in, a, in an out-and-out -out war, could have defeated the Egyptians at this point in time. It wasn't going to happen because of the distance and the type of warfare that they engaged in and all that kind of thing. This is the most powerful nation 
on the face of the earth in the Middle East. And yet, God says, hey, let my people go. I don't have to do that. I don't know you. I don't have to let them go. God says, they're my people. And I want them in my land, worshiping me freely and rightly. And I'm going to bring them out. And so he does. He begins to bring them out. So we too live in a world dominated by a powerful kingdom. And so it's John who tells us this. In 1 John, in chapter 5, the next to the last two verses, 20 and 21, the last verses in chapter 5. We'll come back to them in a minute. In 1 John. But John says, I want you to know something. The whole world lies in the hands of the evil one. We rightly say God is still on his throne. But he does allow the prince of the power of the air, that's what Paul calls him in Ephesians, to have powerful rule and reign over the earth. And those who are outside the rule and the authority of God succumb to that. How many signs have you seen on TV recently? My body, my choice. And on and on and on it goes. I mean, just all kinds of things. That kind of thing. And so it is that those in the hands of the evil one, the whole world lies in the hands of the evil one. Some days we cry out to God, God, give us justice. Why do your people in Myanmar have to suffer this way? Why in Yemen do they have to suffer this way? Why in Iran do they have to suffer this way? Why in China do they have to suffer this way? Why do we increasingly see the signs of it? It might happen here. Do we suffer this way? And God says, the whole world lies in the hands of the evil one. But with regard to that prince of the power of the air, Paul goes on and makes another statement about something else. His power is limited. It is going to be a kingdom eventually destroyed. But first, Jesus came to liberate us. We are oppressed, right, by that evil, like Lot was. Lot saw the evil around him, and Scripture says about him that his heart was twit. Uh, what's the word that he actually uses? I forgot. Anyway. He's, he was disturbed by what he saw all around him there in the book of uh, 2 Peter. But he says that about us too will be a, But nonetheless, here's what's going to happen. Jesus came to liberate us. So go to the book of Galatians. As I said, we don't have time to read all of the scriptures, but we can read some of them. So go to the book of Galatians. We're bouncing off now of Psalm 105. Uh, verse uh, uh, 45, God's purpose. So what is God's purpose? Is sending the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Grace to you. I'm in Galatians chapter 1 at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself, talking about Christ Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, in order to deliver us from this present evil age and the power of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to, live, to deliver us from this evil age, this evil world. He has the power to do that. He has the power to put within us the power of the kingdom. Right? Paul will go on there in Ephesians chapter 2 where he talks about you were dead in your sins and under the control of the prince of the power of the air. But the gracious goodness of our God came. And just before that, in the end of chapter 1, Paul had prayed. And that prayer included a statement of who God is in relationship to us and his power. And the power that God, he says, God sent to you and is working in you is exactly the same power by which he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand and gave him authority to rule and reign until every enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, I've listed that scripture, until every enemy is put under his feet. The way every enemy got put under the feet for the Israelites 
Because they went into the promised land and they were supposed to drive out all those peoples that were in there. They did not, so they left some and that caused them to be under the control often of other people. But the power that he has here to deliver us and to liberate us. Those passages in Ephesians, in Colossians, in 1 Peter, powerful, wonderful scriptures about the power of God working in us. And I'm still, I still can't quite get either my head or my heart wrapped around how great that power is. And, and needing and wanting to experience more of it. And yet at the same time, that's power, right? That is tremendous power. And aren't you glad God is good? Yes. C.S. Lewis has a little set of children's stories and uh, the representative of Christ is a lion. Many of you know those little Narnia stories. And uh, one of the characters says, you know, about the lion, is he, is, is he safe? And the character says, he's not safe, but he is good. <laughs> and that's right. You may not be safe. His power right, may not be safe, but it is good and the goodness of it. And so what do we have? We have a promise. Let's go now to the two last verses of 1 John 5. 1 John chapter 5, the very last two verses of the book. And of that chapter. We know that the whole world lies in the hands of the evil one. And then we also know that the Son of God has come. And he's given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So little children, keep yourselves from idols. And that's the wonder. So what he says to Israel, I brought you out to bring you in so that you can live rightly before me. He says to us, I brought you out to bring you into myself that you may live, may live rightly. So don't take idols on yourself. Same thing he would say to the Israelites many, many, many times. Right? He says to us, don't take idols unto yourself. What a wonder. And so the end of my conclusion, let us join the real conclusion, which is praise the Lord in most translations, it's the Hebrew word, hallelujah! <laughs> That's the way you say that word. <laughs> Father, thank you for your wonderful goodness and mercy in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're wonderful. <laughs>